Well, good morning, everyone. Big welcome if you're watching at home. Really good to have you with us. Um, first week, there's no bookings. I was interesting to, it'll be interesting to see how the 10.30 turns out. Um, it's interesting how the balance of things shifts, isn't it? Um, one thing to say, if you are, particularly if you're watching at home, um, one sort of change this week is obviously there's a selection of seats. Um, when you come, if you come in future weeks, do feel free to kind of use that as you see fit. There's seats where you can sit where it's definitely distant. There's seats where it's closest together. If you want to sit a bit closer together, but not that close, feel free to come and just stick a bag or two on the chairs next to you and kind of like make it a more distant seat. That is completely fine. Um, but really good to have you all. If I haven't met you, my name is Will and I'm Vicar here. A couple of quick things. We said these uh, last couple of weeks, but just to remind again for those who've missed it, uh, things that are coming up in the next few weeks. So first of all, um, hopefully you would have heard on email or on Sunday if you've been about um, an event that we're calling Leaving the Dark Valley. Um, this last kind of, oh gosh, it's coming up to uh, exactly a year and a half, isn't it? Um, this last 18 months has been um, strange to say the least. And I think that, you know there's been lots of times and moments that have felt like a dark valley for various people in various ways and what the aim of this event is and it's an event that's structured in such a way that we hope it will be something that will work for people who are churched non-church like familiar with this not familiar with this it won't be a sort of church service in the kind of classic um uh frame of thinking so do feel free to bring your friends but we hope it'll be a time for people to come and just have a kind of hour of of stillness of reflection of being able to process um more maybe, possibly celebrate, depending, you know, it's, it's like a funeral in some senses, there's varying emotions, but process something of the 18 months and kind of enable us to better look f f uh, forward to what's to come and the kind of the new season of life that we're entering into as, as a community here, um, but also as a, as a country. Um, that's at 7.30 on the 31st of August, which is uh, Tuesday. Um, if you are from church, you will need to sign up for that. We're going to put out a link um, a little closer to the time, um, possibly this week. Um, if you're inviting someone, they don't need to sign up. It's just so we can kind of um, sort of semi-work out um, how best to kind of run things. But that's 7.30 in here. Um, do join us for that. Secondly, um, you might have heard that we are having um, what we're calling the Big Hog Roast. Um, on the 12th of September. That's a Sunday. It's the second Sunday in September, um, and it's the Sunday before we launch into kind of new services at 10.30 and 4, um, which will be the following week. And what we're hoping is it's um, a time where we can kind of just come together as a community. Um, it will hope, I hope, be a kind of outdoor, uh, indoor event, and the sun will be shining like it is gloriously today. If it's not, we'll put an, a kind of open-sided marquee up um, for those people who perhaps, uh, you know, 
want to have a bit more sort of ventilation, don't feel comfortable with being inside so much. Um, if it's beautifully sunny, I'd like to think that many of us will be in the garden anyway. Um, but we'd love you to come to that. You have got to book on. There is a cost. Um, we've got a company coming in to do it. I think it's uh, £10 for an adult, £5 for a child. Um, there's a link that's gone out on email. If you click that, you should be able to book through that. Um, if you don't get that or if you, um, you know, find that tricky to navigate for whatever reason, call into the office. We can book you that way. Um, you can call on the phone or you can kind of um, pop in, uh, leave a message if uh, you don't get an answer and we'll get back to you and make that happen. Fab. Well, we've come together as ever to worship Jesus together. I wonder if we might just stand um, and let's just take a moment to um, just prepare ourselves to worship God as the guys get ready. Let's have a a moment of sort of quiet. You might just want to turn your eyes, turn your heart towards Jesus. And if you're struggling to focus, maybe just, just in the quiet of your heart, just repeat his name. Jesus, thank you for this new day. Thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you together. Lord, I pray you'll help us to know your presence with us, to know what you're saying to us, and to receive everything that you're wanting to give to us today, I pray. Amen. Let's worship him together in song. Oh. 
now into um, a time of confession. Peace, it's music, it's just going to come on. I'm just going to lead us through it. You might find it helpful to close your eyes. Not because it's particularly super spiritual, but it just stops us from being distracted by that which is around us. Jesus, we just invite you to come now and speak to us. We come before you in vulnerability and in humility because we know that we are not as we should be. We are not as you've created us to be. But we know, God, that you want to lead us into that. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would just highlight to us the ways which we walk apart from you, which we sin, which we embrace our brokenness rather than your wholeness. allow him to speak to us.
as God brings things to mind, just lift them to him in an act of confession. you do that, receive his word of forgiveness over you this morning. going to join now in some words of confession together that are going to come up on the screen behind me. Let's say these together. Most merciful God, we confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins. Heal us by your spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. Jesus, we receive your forgiveness. We receive your love. And we thank you and we praise you for everything that you have done and continue to do to draw us into you, to draw us into our home, to draw us into your love, to draw us into your presence. We praise you. We thank you. And we worship you. Amen. Fab, I'm just going to grab my phone. Um, I'd love for us to spend a bit of time in prayer now. Um, I'm sure uh, it can't be something that escapes anyone. The situation that currently is um, in Afghanistan, um, you know, so much uncertainty, like so much already kind of oppression, um, and just, you know, lives being torn apart, panic. Um, and we believe prayer has power. And so we want to pray into that situation in Afghanistan. Now, I'm going to just introduce some kind of things for us to pray into. And then I'll give a bit of space for us to, within that, lift our own prayers. I'm sure there's things that have stuck with us, maybe pictures we've seen, stories we've heard as we've, um, as we've read the news this kind of past week. Let's pray. Jesus, we know that your kingdom is a kingdom that is for this whole world. You want to see all things brought back into right relationship with you, and that completely, 100% includes Afghanistan, Lord, but we see there at the moment a situation that seems so far from, you know, your rule and reign being kind of evident, and we just want to pray for that place. We want to pray that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done on earth as in heaven. Lord, first of all, we want to pray for the people there right now, living amongst, you know, unbelievably challenging conditions, like a life that was, is either no longer or incredibly uncertain. And Jesus, we just pray that you would bring comfort, that you would draw close to all who are suffering, all who are frightened right now, in that country, I pray. You might want to lift before God specific situations that you've heard about, specific people maybe even, who you've heard about this week.
We want to pray now for, um, for leaders, world leaders, and, and also for those who are in leadership within the Taliban. Jesus, we pray for wisdom for our world leaders, for guidance as to the right things to do or not to do, for the right ways to support the people of Afghanistan and to challenge the unjust structures, the things that are not of you that are kind of rising up in that place. And God, we pray for the kind of, you know, the Taliban leadership, Lord Jesus, that there might be repentance there, that there might be a change of ways. Specifically, Lord, we want to pray into, um, you know, the, the oppression of women that has happened in that country over many years and that has got better recently but looks like it's going to get worse. And Lord, we just want to say no to that in you. We want to pray against that. We want to pray that that will not happen again, that, you know, girls will get educated, that women will not be oppressed in that country, but will be able to live freely as you have created them to. Again, you just might want to pray for a specific world leader, maybe an aspect of uh, what's going on in the situation right now that needs the wisdom of Jesus. And finally, we just want to pray for the church in Afghanistan. It's, you know, entering into a season of what looks likely to be, you know, heavy persecution. And we pray for protection for the church out there. But we also pray for boldness, that this might be a time when many might turn to you, Jesus, that the church might find, um, you know, clever ways of sharing the goodness of who you are to, you know, people who need you, which is all of us. But I think we're more open to it in our times of uncertainty and brokenness. And so I just pray the Lord that you empower the church in that place and that you just shine forth your glory through them, that people might see how incredible you are and turn to you. Jesus, we pray your blessing over Afghanistan. We pray for freedom for that country. And we pray that you would guide us as we pray to you this week, as we seek you this week for that country. You would guide us. You would put the, the things on our hearts that you want us to pray into, that we might join you in interceding for that country and see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven, I pray. Amen. Amen. Fabulous. Um, Luke, Luke Walton is coming to, uh, to share with us. We're continuing. It's our penultimate uh, sort of week in this series of Matthew before we hit a bit of a pause into 2022 with it. Um, but I'm just going to pray for you before you, um, before, you, before you share with us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Luke. Thank you for all that he has, um, all the time he's given this week to listening to you, um, to seeking what you're saying through your word to us, your people, this morning. I just pray you help us to be open to hear that. Um, where there's stuff that's clouding our minds, Lord, I just pray you just open up the fog and help us to hear what you're saying to us this morning. Um, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Will. And before I come to the reading, I'm just going to um, 
just going to move this, actually, check that my volume is there. Thank you. Good. Lovely to see you here, and uh, lovely to see you there. You can't reply, but don't worry about it. Um, great. Uh, 1987, disgruntled law student wanders into uh, the uh, Careers Advice Bureau at Leeds University, and uh, the lady there says, uh, what are you looking for? I said, I'm, I'm looking for a job in management. I want to experience something of the breadth of life. Um, probably public service. She said, what, what degree are you doing law? She said, we don't see many of you. Most of you want to go and make money being lawyers. I said, yes, that seems to be the case. Not me. Um, and so she gives me a, a variety of jobs, uh, offers the British police, my dad would never have forgiven me, uh, British Steel or the National Health Service. And um, Ken Clark has just rebooted the training scheme for the National Health Service. And to be honest, it looks pretty good. Apart from anything else, there's a three and a half month Cook's tour where you get to be Mr. Ben and you wake up every morning and you have a different job in the NHS. Phenomenal, phenomenal. You get an elective overseas. I'm thinking, finally, yes, I like this. So I head off for this and it's quite a long process. I have to go and see people. I interview different heads of hospitals before I go into an interview process. There's tons of people applying for the thing. There's several stages. We get to a second stage. It's over a whole weekend. You have to do a whole variety of tasks. You're timed, you're interviewed, you're different compete against each other, and then there's a final interview. Get all the way to the end. And so far, in none of this has anyone asked me anything about being a Christian, which you might say, well, that's pretty obvious, except that my CV is absolutely stuffed with stuff. Like, I do camps, and I'm involved in this at church, and I'm in a band, and I do this, and I do this, and this. So you would have thought. And then suddenly, someone sits opposite on a panel of four people interviewing me at the last stage and says, Mr. Walton, in an age when just so many people are leaving the church, how do you think you can reverse the flood? I said, well, that's a really interesting question, actually, because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I came into the church, and it seems to me that what worked for me works, and that's discipleship. I believed that then, I was a little bit naive. I must admit, I hadn't learned as much now as I had then, but I do still believe that was the right answer. So as we read this passage this morning, I want to invite you to do something. Where do you put yourself in this story? It's the calling of the disciples, so it's really easy. You can be anyone you like. You can even be an imaginary character. I, I do this for a living, okay? You can use your creative imagination to describe a character in the scene that's not there. You can be anybody that's named... Where do you find yourself in this scene? Let's, let's turn to the reading, if we could have that up. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John, also presumably, therefore, son of Zebedee. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. Great. Great. So um, uh, you're allowed to, um, I mean, you may have to remove masks. Somebody in the room, because obviously at home you can shout at screen, but I won't hear you. Um, anybody, anybody choose a character there that they thought they related to or thought that they were thinking about in that scene? I do need some answers. Zebedee. Zebedee. Okay, how it feels to watch your sons go. Yeah, Zebedee, that's a really interesting point. Anybody else? Shout, shout. James. Okay, just James. Anyone else? Just think about that, because I'm going to come back to that question. Who did you observe the eyes through? And there are lots of different ways in which you could read that. And it would be great if it's, it's a kind of a, a, a really good discipline t sometimes to read a scene really slowly and imagine yourself in it, in a particular role. Well, I'm going to give you some context for this uh, story. 
And I'm going to do some which is geographical, some historical, some personal and uh, you know, uh, pastoral about the individuals, uh, personal stuff, a bit about their response and cost. But I want to start by just saying where it comes in the story of Matthew. Because this story comes as we've transitioned from the birth narratives to the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And a few weeks ago, we were in the wilderness with him being tempted by the devil in preparation after his baptism. And then last week, Will was talking about him coming with a message. And we were reflecting ourselves on where we might be called to repent because his message was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So we've had the beginning of a message and now he calls some followers, some disciples, some apprentices. And you may remember we had a series on apprenticeship. Some apprentices, some followers. It's what it means to be a Christian, to be a disciple. And uh, it's going to shoot us into uh, watching what Jesus does as this kingdom comes. And that will be next week. Not going to try and spoil that territory. And then we will be going into the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus will teach what it's like to be in this kingdom. And then we will go on with the The narrative of Matthew sets out more of what this kingdom is and what it brings. And of course, ultimately, there's something very profound going to happen through Jesus himself. But it's the beginning of a really important point. Now, a little bit of geographical uh, setting. You may remember last week as well, Will was talking about Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, and that was the prophecy that this area that had suffered so badly was seeing a great light. People who walked in darkness will see a great light. And it's a little bit of a distant place, Galilee. It's not the kind of hub. However, it was, had it been looked down on, it was also quite well populated. In fact, Josephus, the early historian, says there were 204 villages with no less than 15,000 people. That's a population of 300,000 in the area, making it one of the most densely populated areas of the Middle East at the time. There were a lot of people there. A lot of people to hear about the kingdom. So it wasn't necessarily obvious. Uh, There was a thriving fishing business. It was actually quite prosperous to be out there fishing, uh, except there was a taxation system and a creaming off at the top. You know, the money didn't always go to the people who were doing the hard graft. So, you know, that's not a new story. Apparently, it's always been happening. And it was near the sea, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Really, it's a lake. It's 13 miles long, 7 miles wide. You can see across it. I've actually watched and looked across it as the sun sets. Very beautiful, but it doesn't feel, frankly, like a huge sea. Uh, I guess if you're in the middle and one of the horrendous squalls comes that build up on the lake and you can't see any of the uh, land, then it feels like a sea and you feel well at sea. Uh, But generally speaking, it's a lake. Now, If you go back there today, you can find Capernaum, you can find one of the oldest synagogues, you can find a boat that they dug up from the lake, they found in 1986, preserved. It's it's an example, carbon dated to about the period 50 BC to 50 AD. It carries, it would have had two decks, carried about 15 people, ring any bells in any stories? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? That would have been a standard boat, single sail in the middle. Uh, You can find lots about the area, but we're really more interested in the story of what goes on here. And... Jesus is walking along beside this sea, sees two brothers, and he says to them, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. So Jesus is into early cheesy puns. No, no, he's not particularly into early cheesy puns. He doesn't want to put the big fluorescent poster up outside the church. He is using a first century idiom. And being a fisher of men meant that you were a powerful preacher. It was somebody who could change people's perceptions, views, call people to a difference. It was even older than that. If you go back to Amos and Jeremiah, you'll discover that when judgment was coming, both those prophets talked about fishers of men pulling people out like fish hooks. And there's even ancient Assyrian illustrations of people with rings through their noses being pulled out on ropes. And that was a, a prophecy of judgment as people went into exile. Now, Jesus wasn't using that older one. He was using this sense of come and make a difference. Come and be someone in this rabbinic saying who's preaching powerfully. Who does he go to? Well, it tells us there there's just four people. As you know, Jesus had four disciples. That's very famous. Um, uh, There's Simon called Peter and Andrew. And and then we've got John and uh, we've got James. And it's always fun if you try and make people name all the rest. It's one of those things that you know, Bartholomew always gets left off or something. Um, uh, what are the names? Well, they're, 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 uh, Simon is a Jewish name, but Peter is Greek. 
though of course it's the name Jesus gave him, and it has a little kind of, it has a little, that does have a pun, it's like the Aramaic for rock. Uh, but otherwise, uh, Andrew and Philip, they're Greek names. Doesn't tell us a lot except that the area was kind of mixed, and there's a hint here as Jesus comes into this area that this message of the kingdom of God is not going to simply stay with the people of Israel, but it's going to be for everyone. It's going to reach beyond. They're fishermen. We've already worked that out. That was pretty obvious. They're throwing nets into the lake, casting a net. They'd have had a round net. It'd have had weights at the edge. The, the weights fall fast and you catch the fish. But they'd have probably had three types of nets and they'd have been very adaptable at using the right one for the right time. They knew their stuff. Uh, they were tough. They could persevere. It takes a lot of courage to be a fisherman. Even today in the UK, the UK's most dangerous profession is fishing. Most likely to be killed fishing. Um, they were courageous and tough. Uh, we have this, Matthew just gives us four. Why does he do that? Well, he's being very brief. If you go into Luke, there's more to be found here. But, but Matthew is giving us a quick snapshot because he wants to show us that Jesus calls some people, shows us the ministry, and then teaches about what the kingdom's about. He's doing a, he's doing a brief thing. He doesn't even come to the calling of Matthew till much later on in his account. But he's doing something very efficient for a purpose, setting up the primary audience for the Sermon on the Mount. And maybe, just maybe, the reason he picks on these is that amongst them are three who will have a very intimate experience with Jesus. Because they, they pop up again in this story at the Transfiguration, where they're taken specially on one side with Jesus, and they see Moses and Elijah with him, and then later into the Garden of Gethsemane. First one, I'd have probably made the same mistakes they did. The second one, I think, would have been a really tough gig to go to. I would probably have fallen asleep too. But if you don't know those stories, you can find they go more intimately. So perhaps, he, perhaps that's why Matthew does that. Or perhaps he just wants to say, look, here's the response. Jesus says, follow me, and they get up and they do it like that. Which always asks the question, why would they just drop everything and go? And I've told before that kind of early rabbinic saying, may you be covered with the dust of your rabbi. It was the saying that rabbi said to their followers, uh, that, that it was a blessing on people who were called by a rabbi to follow them. And you had to be the best of the best. You had to have learned the Torah. You had to have learned the whole of the Old Testament. You had to be really good at knowing what the rabbi wanted. And if you were the best of the best of the best, you could get to follow your rabbi. These guys were fishermen. Here was something radical. Jesus wasn't just calling the obvious ones. These were the eager ones, and later on in Matthew's Gospel, we hear about some of the less eager ones, or the ones who are eager and tell them, I'll go anywhere, go anywhere, follow you anywhere. And he says, I, I have got nowhere, to, I'm homeless. You sure you want to follow me? And they go, oh, yeah, no, maybe not. And there are some who are kind of real misfits, because Jesus spends all his time eating with people who are a long way from God eating and drinking. Well, a good teacher was expected to have followers, and uh, here they are, they get up and they go. But it does have a cost, and we get that. If you look at the passage, you see, at once they left their nets and followed him, they were mid-fish, and James and John, they leave. The, the fact that Mark, Matthew says he, they left their boat and their father, there was a sense of leaving both things. It wasn't... It wasn't a permanent cutting off. It wasn't like abandoning the family. But it was definitely a distinct change. There was a cost to be involved. And these four seem to have stood up and ri risen to the challenge straight away. And I, I wonder for us whether we are always ready for that big call, whether we still expect it in our lives. I've always been a big fan of Corrie Ten Boom. And Corrie Ten Boom uh, had this extraordinary ministry following her time during the Second World War, when she and her family hid Jews in Holland. And as a result, the family were imprisoned and went to concentration camps, and all but Corrie died. And I'm always impressed by the fact that she was 56 when she started that, that journey. And she was in her 70s when she was tramping around the world telling people about it. So don't rule out the idea that you might not be called right now, whatever stage of life you feel you're at. Moses was a bit older, so really, don't count yourself out yet, okay? Could be a burning bush on the way home. 
Now, back to the question I asked at the start. Where did you put yourself? I think it's interesting that we pick on Zebedee. I, I kind of hope someone would say Zebedee. That was, that's, I kind of think that is, that's a parting, that's a leaving. There's a, there's a life journey in there. I like the idea it's James and not the obvious Peter, because obviously we're going to hear a lot about Peter. But I wonder if anyone here honestly said, I, I was with Jesus. Because that's the point of this journey. Discipleship is about becoming like Jesus. In part, Pete, uh, you know, Matthew's in a hurry to make a, a, a story about willingness, obedience, and courage. But if we look closer, we miss this bigger picture that, that really this is a little lesson about how Jesus calls disciples. And you have to piece it together with other incidents right through the Gospels. But for me, there's a kind of pattern to this. You know, Jesus says, follow me, learn from me, have a go, I'll watch you go. It's a pattern for our lives. Now, last weekend, some of you will know, Tasha and I had the privilege of leading on a falcon camp. I'd say we're overall leaders. Actually, we had some tremendously experienced leaders with us. It was absolutely brilliant. And there were kids from homes in Bristol and the area who don't have holidays. One child hadn't had a holiday in five years. And this was three nights away. So if you're making a tally of how many holidays you've had in five years despite the pandemic, include weekends away. One kid, just see his face as he's told he doesn't have to choose between beans or tuna or cheese on his baked potato. He can have all three. And one look tells you that never happens. That's lovely. I love that. But do you know what really excited Tash and I? It was to be back as overall leaders after a long break from these things, watching young leaders step up. Absolutely tremendous. Really wonderful to watch Polly uh, be herself and come into her own with her friends and other members of the team and watch them coming alongside young people and helping them. One of the people we were with was called Jane. And in the evening, there's a fire pit, and at a particular time, we brought everybody around, lit a fire, and uh, we all gathered around to, to watch the flames under a sunset. It was absolutely brilliant. It wasn't like this weekend. It was drier, which is good because we were under canvas. Anyway, um, this one lad, first night, uh, there's been a fire starting session where you use a flint, you use a steel to spark some cotton. First thing Jane does is she shows how you do it. Second thing, she helps uh, this young lad. Then she lets him have a go and watches. By night three, the fire, a huge fire that I honestly could not have lit in the same amount of time, was lit by this young lad in the space of 10 minutes. He built it carefully with this kind of Jenga step, the cotton wool and all the away it goes. It's burning. It's a simple, simple pattern. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. I was reflecting on that with my older daughter, Colette. That's exactly the process she's going through in nursing. Just takes quite a few years. Which is, of course, the point. Discipleship, apprenticeship to Jesus takes years. A lifetime. We're always doing it. We're always stepping into that. But when did we stop looking to see what Jesus was doing to copy him? When did we start reading this passage, if we've been around for a while, and not ask ourselves, what can I learn today from Jesus that I need to put into practice? And that's the challenge, I think, this morning. A little while back, everyone had a little bit fan of, of wearing some jewelry. It was a rubber band. And on the rubber band was WWJD, which stood for... What would Jesus do? Yes, the question. I had another friend. He made some uh, rubber bands. I really like these. He, he, he has a magazine called Sorted. Very cool. And they gave away free bands. And it said, what would Scooby do? I think that's a really fun badge. I like that one. Um, but, but the WWJD, is, it's, it's kind of a good question. And it's a bit of a weird one. Because Jesus was a first century male itinerant preacher. And we are in the 20th century in very different contexts. Better to ask ourselves, if Jesus was us, with my gifts, my experience, my background, my ethnicity, what would Jesus do? 
That's the question we should be asking all the time. He comes and walks beside the lake where we are and calls us, will you be fishers of men? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you call us. Thank you that you forgive us. Thank you that you give us fresh opportunities, that every day is a new day to start again. But help us to hear your call and give us again the desire to walk in your footsteps, to be where you are, to do what you do. Amen. Let's just take a moment to just um, continue just in quiet and yeah, just continue that place of prayer that Luke's left us in. Maybe there's something you need to ask God for. Maybe you want to relate more to someone else in the boat. Maybe you want to be a fisher of men. What is it that you need to maybe ask him to help you to become? We're going to continue to respond to God now as we, um, as Chris and the guys lead us in our, in our last song. So feel free to um, stay seated if you know, you're chatting with Jesus, but if not, I invite you to sort of stand and let's um, sing to him together.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, that is our prayer this morning, that you would help us to build our life on you, on you alone, that we would become people who are like you ever increasingly. And God, where there are things that get in the way of that, where there are things that are barriers, obstacles, I just pray that you would identify them to us and give us the wisdom and the insight to know how to kind of navigate around them, Lord. We need you, we seek you, we love you, and we thank you. Amen. Great to see you all this morning. Good to see if you're watching at home. I think there is a Zoom catch-up if you're watching at home a little bit later. Um, But for those of us that are here, um, do head out through the kind of usual door, and we will, um, I'm sure, catch up outside in the lovely sunshine. Have a lovely week, and we will see you very soon.